Hi everyone, it's Calculus by Christy, and if you're wondering how to get a five on the AP Calculus exam, it all starts with knowing your content. And in this video, I'm going to go through a complete review of everything you need to know for Unit 5 of AP Calculus, which is Analytical Applications of Differentiation. We start with the mean value theorem. And the mean value theorem is an existence theorem that you want to make sure you know for the AP exam. And the mean value theorem is this. As long as f of x is continuous on the closed interval a to b and differentiable on the open interval a to b, then there must exist some value c in between a and b such that f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now, one thing I want to point out is that a, b, and c are all x values. So c is going to be an x value that lies in between a and b. And as long as the conditions are met that f is continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, you are guaranteed that the instantaneous rate of change at c will be equal to the average rate of change over your interval a to b. Let me show you what this looks like on a graph. So as we see here, we have a function f of x, and f of x is continuous on the closed interval a to b, meaning that there are no jumps, holes, or vertical asymptotes. Likewise, you can also see that the function is differentiable on the open interval a to b, meaning there are no sharp turns, there are no cusps, and there are no vertical tangent lines. As long as f of x is both continuous and differentiable, the average rate of change between a and b, also known as the slope of the secant line, will be equal to the instantaneous rate of change at some value c lying between a and b, and that would be this also known as the slope of the tangent line, so the instantaneous rate of change. Now I want to go through the steps that you would need to follow if you're going to use the mean value theorem to justify an answer on the AP calculus exam. First, you want to make sure to verify those two conditions. f of x must be both continuous and differentiable on the interval a to b. Then you would want to find the average rate of change on the given interval. So go ahead and find the slope of that secant line between the endpoints of your interval. And then lastly, I always like to use the question stem to then make my conclusion using the mean value theorem. So use the wording in the problem to help you out. All right, now we're gonna go through a second existence theorem, and that is the extreme value theorem. Now for the extreme value theorem, there is one condition that needs to be met, and that one condition is that f of x must be continuous on your given closed interval a to b. As long as that condition is met, then f of x must attain a maximum and a minimum on that interval a to b. Now remember, all that has to be true is that the function has to be continuous. Let's take a look at what that would look like on a graph. So as we see here, I have graphed a function f of x, and that function is continuous. Now notice that that function does not need to be differentiable. So it's okay if that function has a sharp turn, a cusp, or a vertical tangent line. As long as my function is continuous on the interval a to b, we are guaranteed, that's why this is called another existence theorem, we are guaranteed that something exists, we are guaranteed that this function will have an absolute maximum point and an absolute minimum point. Now I want to make note that those absolute extrema that they're called could occur at endpoints or they could occur at relative maximums or minimums. And these x values are also known as critical points. So absolute extrema can either occur at endpoints or at critical points. And that is your second of your existence theorems. There are actually three existence theorems and the third is called the intermediate value theorem or IVT and I've explained that in a previous video. Next is everything that you need to know about the first derivative, f prime of x. And f prime of x tells you about the slope of f of x. Therefore, if f prime of x is greater than zero, then you know that your function f of x must be increasing because that would give a positive slope. 
And then also, conversely, if f prime of x is less than zero, that means f of x must be decreasing because the slope or the slope of the tangent line is negative because a derivative also means the slope of the tangent line. Also with the first derivative, we need to be familiar with something called the first derivative test. And the first derivative test allows us to find relative, also known as local extrema. And I talked a little bit about relative extrema when I introduced the extreme value theorem. So let me go through an example of how you would use the first derivative test to find relative extrema of a function. And notice this function is a polynomial. The first thing you'd have to do to use the first derivative test is you'd need to find where is the derivative equal to zero. By finding where the derivative equals zero or does not exist, you are finding all of your critical values. And critical values are where you have possible points of relative extrema. So first we find the derivative of f of x, and to find the derivative, I simply use the power rule. So the derivative of f of x would be 3x squared, minus 4x minus 4. And I want to find the x values where the derivative would be equal to 0. Therefore, I set this derivative equal to 0. To solve this, I went ahead and factored it. So the factors would be 3x plus 2 times x minus 2. Setting both of those factors equal to 0, you get critical values of negative 2 thirds and positive 2. The next thing I do with those critical values is I place any critical values on a sign chart. And I make sure to label this as f prime of x because in a bit we're going to talk about a second derivative, f double prime of x, which tells you something different about a function. So make sure to always label those sign charts. And then on the sign chart, you're going to put any critical values that you found. So any x values where the derivative equals zero or does not exist. But since our function f of x was a polynomial function, there were no values of x where the derivative did not exist. Next, what I will want to do is I will want to plug in an x value in each of these intervals into the first derivative to see whether the first derivative would be positive or negative. Now, personally, I like to use the factored form when I plug in these numbers because I don't care what the actual number is. I just care whether that first derivative is going to be a positive value or a negative value. So plugging in a number to the left of negative 2 thirds, how about negative 1? It's a lot easier for me to plug in negative 1 into these two factors and to see whether each factor is positive or negative. Plugging in a negative 1 in for x here, you can see that this factor would become negative. Plugging in a negative 1 here, this factor would also be negative, and a negative times a negative would give us a positive. So I know that any x value in this interval would give me a negative first derivative. Now plugging in an x value between negative 2 thirds and 2. How about 0? Plugging in 0 to this factor, I see that the factor would be positive and this factor would be negative. Therefore, a positive number times a negative number would give me a negative number. And then lastly, any number greater than 2. How about 3? Plugging 3 into this factor would give you a positive number. And here, also a positive number. And so a positive times a positive would be a positive number. From here, you read your answer from this sign chart. So let's think about it. If f prime, or the slope of f of x, changes from positive to negative, that means f of x is changing from increasing to decreasing. And if f of x changes from increasing to decreasing, you know that you would have a relative maximum at x equals negative 2 thirds. And then likewise, if f prime of x changes from negative to positive, that means f of x is changing from decreasing to increasing, and therefore you would have a relative minimum. And this is how I like to write out my sentence. So f of x has a relative maximum at x equals negative 2 thirds because f prime of x changes from positive to negative. Notice I'm referencing that first derivative to explain where I have relative or local extrema. And then f of x has a relative minimum at x equals 2 because f prime changes from negative to positive. And that is the first derivative test and all things having to do with the first derivative. Next in unit five is something called the candidate's test. And the candidate's test is used to find absolute extrema. So we just went from finding relative extrema using the first derivative test to finding absolute extrema in the candidate's test. 
absolute extrema means on an entire graph, what is the absolute maximum point and what is the absolute minimum point on the graph. So let's take a look at this example. We are going to find the absolute maxima and minima of the same function from the previous problem. And this time we are given this interval, meaning only look at this interval to find the absolute maximum and minimum points. Well, the problem starts out similar to the previous problem, which includes finding your critical values, finding where the derivative equals zero or where the derivative does not exist. And since we already did that on the previous problem, we know that the derivative equals zero at the x values of negative two thirds and two. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to make a table and we're going to list x values here and then we're going to plug those x values into the original function. Notice this time we're not plugging those x values into the derivative. The reason we're plugging those x values into the function f of x is because we want to find which of these function values give us the absolute highest y value or the absolute lowest y value. Now the x values we're going to test, also known as the candidates that we're going to test, are going to be critical points and endpoints. That is where you can have possible absolute extrema. Absolute extrema can only occur at critical points or endpoints. So those are the candidates that we're going to test. What we're going to do is we're going to test each of these x values into the original function f of x. So first you would find f of negative one. And if you plug in negative one into each of these x values, you get negative six. Also, if you plugged in negative two thirds into f of x, you would get negative 149 over 27, which converts to approximately this decimal, which helped me to compare it to some other values. Plugging in two, we would get negative 15, and finally plugging in three, we would get negative 10. Then what we do is we look at these values of f of x and we decide which value is our highest y value. That is where the absolute maximum would occur. And in that case, it's going to be this value right here because negative 5.519 was my highest y value. And then my lowest y value is down here at negative 15 and that's where the absolute minimum will occur. So I like to write out sentences for my answer. F of X has an absolute maximum of negative 149 over 27 and that occurs at an X value of negative two thirds. So the absolute maximum occurred at one of my critical values which also would happen to be then a relative extrema, a relative maximum. And then f of x had an absolute minimum at negative 15 at the other critical value of x equals two. And that's how you conduct the candidates test to find absolute extrema. Lastly, in unit five, we need to know everything about the second derivative and how to use the second derivative. Now the second derivative tells us about the concavity of the original function, whether the original function is shaped concave up or whether the original function is shaped concave down. So if the second derivative is positive, well, because the second derivative is the derivative or the slope of the first derivative, this would mean f prime of x is increasing. But since it tells you about the concavity of the original function, a positive second derivative would tell you that f of x is concave up. If f double prime of x is negative, that means f prime of x is decreasing or f of x is concave down. Another thing commonly asked about the second derivative is where f of x would have a point of inflection. So I'd like to go over that definition. The definition of a point of inflection is that f double prime has to equal zero or be undefined in an x value and the second derivative has to change signs. As long as the second derivative is zero or undefined and the second derivative changes signs, that means f prime would have a relative extrema and f of x then therefore has a point of inflection. Now, just like the first derivative had a first derivative test, the second derivative also has a second derivative test. Now, the second derivative test also finds relative extrema, just like the first derivative test did. But the first derivative used slope to find relative extrema, and the second derivative test uses concavity to find relative extrema. So let's take a look at how you'd use the second derivative test. For the second derivative test, you first have to consider what are the values where the derivative equals zero, which means finding those critical values, just like you started the first derivative test with. 
The reason you do this is because you first need to make sure that there is a critical value at x, meaning you have a possible relative extrema. From here, we use the second derivative to determine concavity. As long as you know you have a critical value, a possible relative extrema, if the second derivative is negative or the second derivative is positive, that tells you whether the function will be concave down or concave up. So in this case, when the second derivative is negative, that means my function is concave down. And if the first derivative is zero, meaning the slope of your tangent line at that value is zero, and the second derivative is negative, meaning your function is concave down, you know that that x value must be a location of a relative maximum. Conversely, if the second derivative is positive, that means your function is concave up at a critical value. And so therefore, you know that that x value must be a relative minimum. All right, everyone, I hope this was a great review of everything you need to know for Unit 5 of AP Calculus. And like I said, going through these reviews and studying each of these videos is surely to help you get a 5 on the AP Calculus exam. Thanks for watching, everybody. And if you found this helpful, give it a like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Have a great day, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.